Welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Today we have our lecture 12 on Docker and Container Management. And we touched upon this topic since many lectures now. Basically, we have introduced containers a little bit here and there, but still we want to look a little bit more under the hood. Um, what are the benefits? Uh, how it is fueled with virtualization? But what are differences to the traditional virtualization when you introduce containers? But then we have also the cloud scale and the big data scale to think about. So the question would be also in this lecture, how we really scale up with a big cluster using this container technology. And then you quickly come to uh, tools like Kubernetes, like Mesos that really you know, schedule the workload then across different clusters. So these will be all several topics and elements of this Docker and container management today. But first, before we go into the material of this lecture, you know, let us review what we had the last time. <clears throat> the last time was then really a practical lecture, 11.1, very highly relevant for your assignment, where you actively are all working on, I hope. So this was all about data mining, recommenders in clouds, while the data mining part was already nicely introduced by one of my um, you know, postdocs, um, Shadi Barakat, um, who did a PhD with me at the University of Eisen, is now at Jülich. Um, he introduced you to association rule mining. And uh, this was in lecture 11, was very conceptual. We talked about how the different algorithms can be implemented, like a priori or the FP growth algorithm. And we learned quickly that basically if you scale up, in many cases, um, you would even say more generally in computer science, tree-based algorithms like FP growth are just much better in performance. This is a topic that goes back to 101 computer science, um, really. And we have basically demonstrated this in lecture 11.1. So we don't really introduce new algorithms for association rule mining. I just took some, let's say, toy examples where you would think, OK, really, is this big data? Um, and of course, it's not. Right, But the key message to take away when I do these simple examples, what you also do in your assignments, is of course that you would have maybe millions or billions of transactions over years, maybe over decades for a retailer. <clears throat> then it gets quickly out of hand with doing this on your little laptop. right? And this is a key idea really when we show this, that the implementation we show here are using the cloud, have let's say cutting edge computing power, have really good, um, let's say, storage opportunities to really read, let's say, many of these transactions um, then from the file system that we have seen also in the JC Cloud. So <clears throat> essentially, in my practical lecture 11.1, you have seen a little bit that we also can upload simple things to the cloud. Uh, you have, we have used basically the JC Cloud as you should use in your assignment. But there we have to upload, of course, the Vita notebook parts. We have to, you know, basically then also use this kernel script that I was showing. So there is also a new element in your assignment three. So take care. Um, there have been some changes for assignment three from version one to version two. Hence, the idea is really um, now using a kernel script with the kernel script in the JC cloud. You get the opportunity then to work in a virtual environment where you then can install ML extend. And the ML extend library is then the one that really provides us with the you know different algorithms that we have. And um, we also learned that of course these algorithms have then lots of configuration elements that you can you know steer, you can look a little bit in order to understand then um, what the shopping list entails. You see also quite good um, overviews here um, in, in this part of the outcome here um, or the support really of how well we really um, you know support these findings in a way so how strong is this kind of rule that we find out of this so there's let's say a huge area where uh, you know for basically analyzing shopping basket uh, doesn't have to be of course just cheese and wine so that's of course clear it can be also um, you know basically all sorts of retail um, organizations. And with this, you have a tool at hand where you can directly use in a scalable fashion also, um, you know, this association rule mining approach. Now, a little bit new 
in the last lecture then was this recommender engines and this was not really part of the conceptual lecture in lecture 11 so i really introduced you a little bit to the world of recommender engines because i think it gained quite um, some attractions in the last five to ten years so i think we should more teach this and we have seen that there are a lot of different recommenders and those of you that already looked in the google collab link i gave you you see there are different ways how you can actually do um, basically recommender engines. And we picked the one um, that is here also shown a little bit, which is really collaborative filtering. So standing for the point that we not only want to recommend something that is about content. So we have seen that is very easy, right? So when we said in the last lecture, uh, I like cowboy movies uh, or Westerns, uh, as it is sometimes called, so then, you know, basically based on this content, I can recommend you having seen five or 10 Western movies, probably the next five and there's high chances perhaps that I will look that. So the, the more intense way of recommending is then go one step further, right? Also when you're combining it, maybe now with the, with the effect that you had from the association rule mining, this was not really personal. Right, you have seen the analyzing shopping basket. We have no idea who is buying that. Uh, we just know from many, many transactions, we can understand that people that buy diapers buy beer. But um, the point is in recommender engines and especially in collaborative filters, ring to to go one step further to basically learn so-called embeddings that tell us something about the movies that we were watched. Uh, and this is something which will be learned automatically using matrix factorization, if you remember from the last lecture, but then also learning something about the humans that really watch this movie. So we put, let's say, the uh, bluntly speaking a little bit, these personalities as different ones in a mathematical, mathematical model that we then use with matrix factorization to, to basically come back to the results. And that's now the interesting thing. So we have this table in a sense a little bit given as a guiding light that is essentially representing roughly what we see here. So every time you see a positive video, uh, you know, value, you can see, okay, that are things which have been watched. And then there are basically other values which are positive um, that have been also watched. So there's some sort of, let's say, approximately resemblance of this matrix. But in order to do so and to learn this matrix factorization that you see here, uh, which you see essentially with the dot product here um, with U and V standing for the user and the videos, um, you come to this kind of interesting idea that this A, um, you know, matrix that you have here should resemble what you see essentially here when they people have recommended these movies. Now, the benefit it gives us is then that we not only can recommend movies based on this mathematical let's say embeddings that have been, you know, looked um, by others, but it could be then that we can give with this collaborative filter and real recommendations that not only have been looked by others, but by these others that are very similar to me. Again, so this is an important factor. So we recommend with this collaborative filtering elements of users, which not only basically have seen similar videos but that seem also very similar to me then right so to me as a user and this makes it so powerful and you can imagine that um with now here again thinking about cloud computing big data you will love okay we have here five uh, fantastic movies maybe and for users take away the message that netflix has you know how many users millions and has lots of lots of you know titles in the repository. So again, this little example, toy example, really, um, that we have seen. Also, then when I put the practicals in, uh, we had I mean movie recommendations and data from the uh, official you know um, lens data set. It's an open data set that everybody knows. There are two flavors: a small one and a big one. We looked at the small one. I encourage you to try out the big one in the assignment, uh, perhaps also to get a better grade, right? But um, the long story is basically, um, these are all toy examples still. So really, you know, the streamers that we have today, like Amazon 
Prime or also Netflix, whatever, um, they have many, many of these users and many, many of these videos. So hence, you can understand that a very specifically targeted user-oriented recommendation can, you know, basically make the user very happy, meaning that the subscription will be renewed and that basically the streamer is happy. Now, without talking too much about the last lecture, because it's basically really an important part for your assignment, the interesting bits and pieces were again making connection to the CRISP DM model. Um, that is what you see here, starting with a problem understanding, then understanding the data, looking at the data, data inspection, data exploration. Then you have to prepare the data often, um, putting it in a way you remember the last time I put some things in hot encoding or one hot encoding, um, basically meaning that um, a shopping list like this is something that we want to transfer when we really read in the retail data set that gives us, let's say, a comma separated value, CSV, that's what it stands for, of data. And sometimes there will be not a number, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like a little bit unfortunate for some of the algorithms. That's why, and it's the same way here, we do this transaction encoder. And also for the a priori, we did this one hot encoding which is already data preparation for the modeling because then the algorithms could much more easier handle it. So <clears throat> at the end, we have seen there's some evaluation. We have lots of lots of association rules which are coming out of this, but which are those which have, let's say, um, a threshold satisfied, which would be maybe the minimum support of uh, 0 0.8 or something. And there are lots of configuration that of course, not everything what you see there is necessarily true. Um, you will see that maybe when you play around a little bit with the minimum support in the assignment, you, you sometimes get really rubbish out of this. Um, but of course, this depends now on how you on how high you set the threshold, right? So some rules are really nonsense. So this really means we need to evaluate, right? Really, what we have done, and maybe even sometimes think when we have big data and it gets stuck, um, like maybe with the a priori algorithm, we would go back to the problem understanding and do another loop and rather use maybe the FP growth algorithm. To connect it to the cloud um, lecture again, um, and we also, I mean, with this going slowly towards the end of the course, so you have learned a lot. The FP growth is also implemented in, the, in Spark. So you could also do this, let's say, with the Apache Spark toolset that we have learned earlier with the MLlib library. I didn't make the connection because we would put too much uh, all in, a, in one lecture. But you see also how this different elements of this um, basically cloud lecture are really highly interconnected. Hints here and there you see, of course, as repetitions, right? But the repetitions are useful to make you aware that, of course, what you do in one cloud, you can also do in other clouds. And a final remark, and then really we go to the next topic on Docker, is we have used the JSC cloud. And one <clears throat> takeaway message why we use this was essentially the fact that it's based on OpenStack. So we have used hyperscalers a lot in the course. We basically have seen, um, you know, MS Asia, we have AWS, and we have also the Google Cloud, even the collaboratory of Google used. Now, because we're switching also soon to OpenStack in, in one of the lectures, um, it's important for you to realize that the JC Cloud, while you're doing your assignment the next month, is actually something built on non from non hyperscaler so that as i said earlier in the course there is an opportunity to create your own cloud right and that's what jc has done with the jc cloud it uses components of openstack these are not obvious to you right we will see how that materializes when we come to lecture 14 that is all about openstack i show you all the components what you need compute network storage but the point is, while you're doing this, you're already using a technology that is fundamentally based on OpenStack and enables then, of course, virtualization topics you learned also earlier in the course. Hence, let's go a little bit now into the material um, of lecture 12. As I said, Docker and container management. Again, here and there, we touch this topic just necessarily because you see that containers today are really fueling a lot of cloud computing resources. But they are sort of hidden, right? So they're really a little bit behind the scene, uh, mostly because they are, you know, on the on the very low level containing libraries, applications, and so on. 
Docker is a specific technology that is often used in this context and, and quite known also. So chances are you have heard from this technology before. But we will also talk about several other um, parts of this um, container technology. And what we do in the first place is now to really, of course, start with Docker, think about the service challenges with many different versions, many different applications, libraries, dependencies, data shipping alongside. Um, it's a complex world. So in the end, what you want to do is then to, to really see how we can make it simpler with the containerization. And we use Docker there as an example, just because there's also other technologies that we will see then in lecture, uh, you know, basically in the second part of the lecture. So we want to understand a little bit what the benefits of virtualization versus container orchestration is. Um, of course, as it is a machine learning and deep learning inspired course, uh, you know, working with deep learning, for instance, to leverage big data, really. I show you some examples how people have used Kubernetes as orchestration of or containers using Docker in different of these hyperscaler technologies, AWS, for instance, and so on. There will be also an industrial application, for instance, a cookpad that is quite fascinating. And of course, we, we would like to also point to the fact that other cloud services doing very similar things. So just to make the case that Docker and containers are basically everywhere, and many people use them today to create interesting applications. So then the second part of the lecture today could show you some more advanced container concepts and examples. So there we will go back to the deep learning that we had in the course already, the Google Cloud, what is possible there in containers. You remember deep learning had many, many different libraries, many different um, dependencies on NVIDIA, CUDA, et cetera. And then we look at some other clouds that we didn't really look at, as I promised you towards the end of the course, we also go a bit broader. We have the JC Cloud, now we look at the EBM Cloud, Alibaba is also something to mention here. And then there's some, um, you know, concrete elements because that is something which is really alluding to to a niche market and also shows you very nicely that uh, basically there can be a business case for niche markets, which are the cloud solution for engineers. We had this already with the Uber Cloud a little bit um, when we talked earlier about this approach. Um, needless to say, I talked to you at that time also that this has been now um, created as a joint venture called Zim Air now. But I still would like to keep this example that you also see that this really takes off, right? And, and this is, I think, one of the key benefits of not only container technology, but also the idea of cloud computing that niche markets have a chance. And we will talk about this niche market, for instance, CFD is really something just for experts in, in this particular elements of fluid flow and let's say maybe Havoc, um, you know, heat, ventilation, and airflow, et cetera. But there's like HPC cloud simulation examples which stand the test of time that are required, but of course only for a very niche market. And still uh, this Uber Cloud company, um, where I happen to know also the CEO, very good, um, of course now joined with SimR, as I have told you earlier. Now a new endeavor. So quite an interesting use case because it shows you the liveliness of core computing. It shows you that not only hyperscalers are in this area, but a very dynamic SME or let's say maybe medium enterprise um, area. And some of them um, you will also see then when we come to our final project, some of you have already done my um, you know office hours on this where we use and the rescale cloud for instance, on responsible compute applications here in Iceland. So another cloud, um, not as huge as the hyperscalers like AWS, MS Azure, still very powerful for certain applications. And then at the end of part two, we really want to show you some other container solutions, singularity, obtainer. These are elements which are used also in the JSC, right? So basically when you look to our big HPC supercomputers, um, often singularity is there deployed to enable essentially the exchange of Docker containers here and there that works quite well. It needs some massaging sometimes, so there is some interoperability between Docker and Singularity and Obtainer. So of course, and Mesos are other topics where we need another complete lecture 
to do, let's say, orchestration, similar in a way like Kubernetes, maybe a bit more on scheduling. But um, this is something which we, you know, can just touch briefly just to basically get you some insights about the name and the approaches. Hence, a fully packed lecture. Uh, one could argue maybe again that Docker and container management could now easily fill three, four lectures of my um, basically lecture series here, but we don't have them. And I have to refer you probably to other software engineering courses that hopefully integrate container management uh, in their course curricula. So let us start with part one, uh, basically now with Docker and container management. And this brings us back a little bit now to the idea of what is cloud computing. Uh, we said services are essentially in the in the key element. And we have seen many of those. We have come a long way in lecture 12. Um, we have been going through many practical lecture, but also really, let's say, conceptual lecture, like we had lecture 8, 9, 10. That was sort of really important for you to understand that there are different levels, but the service character of the cloud remains the same. Now, doing this on a global data center scale, doing this with different services, the question is um, how you really achieve this is all the service, and, and this brings us later to a so-called name microservices, which are also very common to know in this area of Docker and containers and so on. So how we make it sure that basically all the required libraries, tools, um, data, uh, everything is basically captured correctly, right? So when we now think about, we have to port from one data center to another, we want to move from AWS to the Google Cloud Platform, um, we basically want to use it in JSC, basically in the JSC Cloud. So there's some need for a tool that really bundles um, all the dependencies, these configurations, right? And then shipping around basically this application much more easily that we can do usually maybe just by using virtualization. And we have talked about this a little bit already. So you see here quite a nice overview what the, are the container benefits I will now explore in this lecture versus virtual machine benefits you learned already in lecture four. Right, so we're not talking against the virtualization approach here. So it's needed and absolutely essential for cloud computing. But what container technologies and many things will just be using virtual machines. But what we want to achieve here with containers is a little bit, let's say, a more, more application oriented element for very specific problems, right? So you would find Docker containers much more specialized for certain problems while Virtual machines are really much more broader. Hence, they have also, let's say, different um, disadvantages because the disk size is bigger. We will come to this in a moment. And they carry around some overhead with an operating system and so on. But that is the motivation of this. And <clears throat> if you look at Docker as an open source container technology today, as an example, um, we discussed some of this already. When we talked about, you know, the Hadoop approach, um, if you remember a little bit what we had, you know, in the earlier parts of the course, where we started with MapReduce, Hadoop was one implementation of it. We had data nodes, we have, you know, the master worker. Uh, I apologize for the Hadoop slave here. This should be by now the worker Hadoop. But um, this enables us to understand what I just said, that they are very specialized now results um, to be found in the Docker Hub, which is basically a sort of registry where you can find already Docker containers which are um, ready to create something what you need. And this need could be very specific. Like here, we have essentially the master uh, worker paradigm that we have in Hadoop. So when we want to create a Hadoop cluster feud with Docker, we can do this easily by using the Docker Hub and download essentially these containers, and this is already similar, like you remember a little bit with this virtual images, right? Or this virtualization approach where we have this images, like we had the AMI, for instance, in um, Amazon, if you remember, around deep learning, for example. This is a similar idea. So you download everything which needs to know about the data nodes, the 
worker nodes or the name nodes, etc., and then <clears throat> can use this different, let's say, containers to create your own cluster, right? Of course, for that to happen, you need essentially the the kind of Docker runtime itself. But this enables us to really learn from others. Um, we save a lot of time by reusing this image repository with elements, um, you know, of free software, which is already pre-configured, very easy to orchestrate, and then, um, you know, do basically um, the deployment very similar, like you have in virtualization, but now you have some benefits, and you see that a little bit alluding here. Instead of, you know, doing the infrastructure and then host operating system and the uh, hypervisor technology, we have directly Docker with different applications that maybe include different libraries. And with this, you see a little bit what we see here from your local Linux or Windows machines, different operating systems. Um, we can actually very quickly with Docker, not thinking about this different, um, you know, kind of host operating systems, go to the data center, cloud, to your laptop again, etc. So in context, we have also Kubernetes. I will talk about this as well. That's why basically the red part is now, um, you know, basically as a focus for the next couple of slides that we talk about Docker mostly. So the best analogy is basically if you move yourself here in Iceland to our ports, you will see probably instead of the Maersk line, much more Imskip ships that have tons of these containers. And in a way, that is a really nice analogy uh, of how container images have changed the world. Um, basically, you can transport them, ship them. Um, you can basically port them to, to different ships, and it doesn't matter. Right, so different chips in the analogy of different clouds. So in a sense, you know, this is like here for the transportation sector, um, a very interesting technology to think about software. So in a way, the container has everything ready to run for the software. It has all the different runtime source code, but also then very specific libraries that can be pulled and basically then downloaded. And even many of them, especially in data sciences, come already with you know, preloaded data sets that are relevant. So <clears throat> it enables enormously flexibility. And um, if you want, it's it's almost like a standardization. You see here also in the picture, right, uh, we see how the size of the containers is always the same. Of course, in the system uh, for software, we have a little bit more flexibility. For us, the size is not the most important part but it's more important that it works with the overall, let's say, Docker engine as an example here. Then um, you can think really about taking one Docker image that you maybe got from the Docker Hub as an example, or you create your own one, and then run it in different hyperscalers like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, etc. But you also can do it for you know specific clouds, maybe an Uber cloud and engineering, which we will explore in the second part, uh, or basically now we'll also think about the Sim Air, which is you know, the Uber Cloud successor or basically the, the next generation. Hence, to the picture that we had before, we have to add a little bit the binaries, the libraries that make sense of an application um, that is now basically fueled on top of the Docker engine. And, you know, having, of course, still the need when you think about real infrastructure, the physical infrastructure here of an operating system. But the Docker engine then is basically independent of what operating system is there. You just run the kind of idea. It's open source. It's incredibly often used. And uh, the difference really from virtualization to container approaches, we looked sometimes already. The virtualization has quite a high storage footprint. If you want to save an image, it takes quite lots of space. And one of the key reasons is, if you look at traditional virtualizations, that we carry around uh, the the ballast really of a guest operating system. So talking about ballast is is an unfair way of saying it. Um, the virtualization approach, with having still a guest operating system, is very powerful in the end. But you can imagine that for some applications, it maybe doesn't even matter which application or guest operating system you have. So hence, this is all exchanged together with the hyper, hypervisor here, with the so-called Docker engine that then has a much more low storage footprint. And it's basically then on top of it, if you think about 
a little bit that you're trapped in Windows, Mac, Linux, etc. You're a little bit vendor lock free. So you can really, if you base your applications on this, go quickly from one cloud provider to another. And then the chances are that you prevent a so-called vendor lock, which is um, a, a key element also when you establish your business sometimes. Because if you are, are in a vendor lock, then of course, chances are that this particular vendor can dictate prices and you don't want to do that. You want to be able to be flexible, see what the market has to offer, and maybe also go to another cloud provider. Hence, let's have some examples. Um, some of them are already showed to you in earlier course elements. Hence, I'll go a little bit quicker here through this. The container registry is an important part that we have seen, for instance, on the platform as a service level, um, where we have essentially a let's say, a Google App Engine or Google Cloud-specific container registry for Docker images, where, you know, you, have, you can store these images there. And then, of course, be using it for your own applications, instantiated, and so on with different services. Also, the AWS service landscape, of course, has something similar. It's called the Elastic Container Registry. So, again, I make the case that the hyperscalers, in one way or another, support this technology. It's also based on Docker. And here you see now the example, if you would have a registry um, basically in the Google App Engine somewhere of some particular Docker image, you can download or can basically transfer the Docker image also to the AWS space and upload it then in the Elastic Container Registry and then being able to use the image again. But then of course on the Amazon uh, basically runtime. So there's a specific, um, you would say, um, container registry for it. Um, needless to say, um, basically this idea of running so-called microservices um, via this different, let's say, uh, containerized applications um, for, a, let's say, much bigger application, for instance, is something specifically supported with the Elastic Container Service. And when you then go bigger to really scale, and this is now the difference, if you see a little bit what we have um, heard about before. So we have this interesting Amazon ECS service that runs containerized applications and microservices. But we have also the opportunity to use this EKS, uh, which then is a Kubernetes service. And it's something we also will talk later about it when you really um, have a need for a larger application scenario. Hence, <clears throat> you see here many benefits, um, but you have from this um, containerized approach. You um, pull these images and run containers everywhere. There will be source code really, uh, you know, pulled and data pulled where it's basically, you know, described in so-called Docker recipes. But this is a level we don't want to go in very much in this particular lecture. Again, I think software engineering today and in software development will talk about containers, also how you do it. Um, here just some um, examples how this Elastic Container Service, for instance, is used, um, where you basically have then the idea of running this with different applications. You see also some power users of the AWS ECS um, that we discussed um, with Ubisoft, for instance, in the gaming industry or GoPro, you see in the in the video you know, creator uh, industry. So this is something where big vendors really use this service on a daily basis. And then, um, you know, combine this with different computing products, of course, here, um, you know, we have different options. The one that you know already was the Amazon EC2. Uh, we talked about this. We had some demonstration around it, the key pairs, etc. But you see with AWS Fargate, you have also basically another opportunity to do absolutely no menu resource provisioning. So this is really uh, a much more easier way, especially if you are in this container business to really abstract from the lower level. Another <clears throat> application that maybe uh, shows you a little bit the advantages is now Cookpad and also the impact, right, of what this container technology has to do these days, um, especially with the uh, adverse and basically the, the kind of powerful deep learning um, applications that we see. So here is a, let's say, um, interesting application where another deep learning package is used that we don't um, know yet. It's the MXNet um, package. And you see how that works a little bit. It's a nice um, overview. So firstly, of course, you 
have you with a notebook, you do your modeling, you're a data scientist, you upload the model into some storage in S3 that we already know from one of earlier lectures. Um, then you basically have some source code that you would work together, um, have a code build, um, deploying this basically then um, in the Amazon ECR, the container registry. And then uh, this one will absolutely give you the opportunity to, to instantiate containers um, every time you basically use then the app, right? And with this, you have this application load balancer. So more and more instances will be either created or some instances will be stopped. And with this, you basically have the chance of scaling up. <clears throat> and all of that is enabled by having the light with the right libraries and application part inside a container. So um, you see here the containerized machine learning um, is clusters of GPU enabled EC2 instances that are in the end here the, the power horse fueling it. And you see people can upload um, here the the food photos and so on. You can look at Cookpad a bit more in detail if you want. They have 140,000 users plus uh, today, maybe even more. So this is something which also needs inherently scalability uh, for massive photo uploading. And this is just one step. Think about that videos are just around the corner. So it has also to deal with this kind of spikes that cloud, clouds are often encountering. So there's a so-called TV show um, that goes alongside with it. And in the end, this means after the TV show, when there's such an event, there will be also lots of apps introduced uh, the first time to some users and they're really downloading it and using it. So in this sense, uh, we have several spikes at these specific events and the cloud can handle that very well. As another example, so um, now thinking about again, the differences, traditional work VMs, um, we have basically the, the challenge essentially that now we talk about a semi-automated approach. We have everything we need essentially inside this kind of Docker containers uh, based on the Docker engine. But now we come to some you know, kind of scalability concern when we want to do automation, if we want to use a large cluster think about the analogy again we have a big ship right with very many containers and if you want someone in this ship and maybe even in the ports need to have an overview they need to know a little bit more about you know what's where in which container what it belongs to etc so we talk about this about orchestration right so this means when we really want to automate this process in in software and with using docker we need someone who has a bigger picture. And this is usually done by Kubernetes, by so-called kubelets. Hence, I come back to the initial part where I stopped um, and said we focus on Docker first. Let us go a little bit to Kubernetes uh, just to show you this. Needless to say, as I often say now, by really um, showing you advanced cloud examples, really, Kubernetes could be you know, teach in a complete practical at least and also three, four conceptual slides. So it's a very powerful engine uh, actually coming from Google that really deal with the automatic scaling of all these kind of different containers that we want, scaling up and down management on these different nodes that we have in the clouds. And with this, you come to an automatic cluster management, which is very important for us. Um, also thinking about that this is not only deep learning application, could be now Apache Spark, Right, being like Hadoop, I showed you already here inside the different, um, let's say, Docker images. And I want to scale up Apache uh, Spark with different worker nodes. And this is where Kubernetes and Kubelets can also help you um, by providing a very interesting environment. And of course, it's used also, for instance, in the Google Cloud. How it works a little bit is that there is a master and then again, a worker paradigm that what you already know, where then Docker is combined with so-called kubelets, making the connection to the Kubernetes master service. And it gives you lots of features. So you really have a better health monitoring uh, above the container engine, right? So is some Docker container maybe not working, but you instantiate maybe 20 of them. You have basically automatic scaling possibilities. You can suddenly you know, have two 
four, eight more instantiated. And um, essentially, you can deploy it in, in different clouds, really. So it, here you see Linux servers, but it could be that a different cloud is even you know, doing maybe Windows servers, but it doesn't matter if you remember, as long as we have the Docker and also the Kubernetes server running. So this is a really, let's say, tool that goes usually along in cloud computing uh, with the container technology. Um, it's really, um, you know, basically helping the containerized application, which are already very smart, to really have, you know, basically the, the running view on it. So in a bigger scale, it can schedule, um, you know, several Docker image instances on various nodes to save cost, maybe at night. Uh, there are different examples where you would say this is a smart tool really to use in combination of Docker today. Hence, many people are using it. Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, for instance, here again, you see here some testimonials of many different companies using this on a daily basis. Uh, again, you would have the Elastic Container Service, um, where you basically have this orchestration service that you use with your Docker images uh, that you pull out of the Elastic Container Registry. So this is one part. Or you use the Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service and that is a bit more on scalability where you really talk about clusters, right? So bigger instances. Um, think about Spark, right? We have many different worker nodes we want to deploy. We have a couple of, let's say, master nodes we want to deploy and so on, and maybe even data nodes. And this is something where then the, the Kubernetes part of it can really manage these containers very well. So it's another way of orchestrating your workload of course, here and there, you see that the prices will also increase when you use all of these advanced services. But in a way, they also then provide you with some quite nice scalability. Here's another in interesting example from P Interest, for instance, that some of you know how they use essentially these services. Um, <clears throat> this is relating also again to PyTorch, which is a deep learning package you don't really heard about yet as well. We talked about TensorFlow, we talked about Keras. But now PyTorch is a very popular deep learning puppet framework, really, that is a, let's say, tool that really gains popularity a lot. And you can see here in the graphic um, very nicely how Amazon is again used by using this torch um, essentially um, inside the cloud by, by using a Kubernetes worker node engine that then, of course, can instantiate several of those kubelets, or basically several of these instances to do an elastic load balancing, for instance, depending on how many people use P-Interest, how many things they do, and so on. So this is a quite more, let's say, elaborate topic. I would encourage you to maybe look at the example a little bit more if you have time. But essentially, what we see is that um, a specific model training is happening. We have the Torch serve here, basically a model server that have, you know, is a chance of registering this deep learning applications and this all works quite nicely well together with essentially the, um, you know, elastic Kubernetes services. So hence, um, without taking too much time of you, this is a topic um, very on vogue. There's one technology that maybe comes later here now in part two that is also very relevant, like Mesos, for instance. But essentially, I've seen how to scale up a Docker container idea from one Docker container to really many different, uh, you know, instantiated by kubelets with kubelets um, in the Kubernetes engines. So scaling up. There's one thing I would teach more when I would have time, which is called microservices with containers, but this video entails it quite nicely. And I think also in computer science these days in software engineering um, and software development, teaching lectures, the role of microservices is teach much more. So it's not my role here in this course to really target that a lot, but it's also one of the advantages, if you want, of computing here in the cloud of supporting this service model with the microservices incredibly well, especially if you think about different options, different vendors, different computing complexity, different databases perhaps. So look at this video, I would encourage you to do that now and we will continue with part two in 10 minutes.